Around half of all hereditary breast cancer stems from inheriting a BRCA1 gene with a pathogenic mutation. These genetic variants result in a loss of the protein's critical tumor suppressive function in maintaining genomic integrity, serving as the first hit for cancer development. Accordingly, genetic screens to identify carriers of these pathogenic variants are valuable to identify patients that will benefit from screening to catch cancer early. Second, something popped up. Yeah, screening to catch cancer early, interventions that can reduce cancer risk, and, and targeted therapies in the case that cancer does develop. Benefits also extend to the relative of these carriers uh, as they become eligible for reflex genetic screening to see if they inherited the same mutation. Alternatively, we may uncover a variant that's benign, not increasing cancer risk or affecting tumor suppressive function, a result which alleviates anxiety and reduces the cause or and reduces the hardship of unnecessary uh, intervention. Unfortunately, there are also BUSs. Mutations for which we're unsure how they affect tumor suppressor function and overall cancer risk. Accordingly, these patients are sent away anxious and with no insight as to whether pursuing intervention will be beneficial or an undue cost. We also lose the benefit of targeted therapies and reflex screening here. And while VUSs constitute 40% of all BRCA1 variants, the problem is even bigger for missense or single, uh, single amino acid variants with over 87% having uncertain significance. Complicating the VUS solution, standards for variant classification defined by the MC ACMG are stringent. These standards define, well, let me get my laser pointer out. These standards define four, can you see that? Oh. Yeah, how does this work? Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. these, uh, these standards define four main evidence strengths or weightings, as well as combinations of these weightings, which can be added together to produce an overall probability of pathogenicity. This probability then falls into one of five variant categories, pathogenic with over 99% confidence, likely or over 90% confident pathogenic, VUS, likely benign and benign. Unfortunately, the strongest evidence uh, is most the strongest evidence types are mostly unobtainable for missense variants. Very strong evidence is reserved for proteins where there is a loss of a large sequence, which is easily attributed to loss of tumor suppressor function. And also, since many missense variants are present at a low frequency, strong pedigree populate or strong family pedigree and population segregation analyses are off the table in most cases, as these require following many people with the same VUS over a long period of time to see if that variant does indeed increase cancer risk. Luckily, assays to measure uh, to the tumor suppressive activity of variants, variants can address almost any variant much faster. If we see a variant loses this critical function, we have moderate evidence that it's pathogenic and increases cancer risk. Unfortunately, though, the critical tumor suppressive function of BRCA1 remains elusive. We know that it has a broad pleiotropic role in maintaining genomic integrity, but the specific function or functions that when removed allow cancer to grow remain unknown. Unfortunately, as well, there are over 5,000 BRCA VUSs, far too many for the throughput of our lab to address. The only evidence that can reasonably scale to this problem are in silico algorithms that predict the impact of variants computationally. But considering the low relevance of computer models to true human physiology, this evidence is the weakest or supporting. Considering the evidence guidelines and the capabilities of our lab, we hypothesize that an assay to quantify overall BRCA1 function could provide moderate evidence for classifying the USs that were most supported as pathogenic and benign on computational analyses. And this was approached with two main aims. First, use an in silico analysis to obtain supporting evidence for VUSs and identify those predicted most pathogenic and least pathogenic with the thought that they were likely to obtain consistent and well-defined evidence on AIM-2. There, we aim to assay a comprehensive readout of the total pleiotropic function of variant BRCA1s. That way, if this overall function is lost, 
we can infer that it also involves a loss of tumor suppression, even though we haven't identified the precise mechanisms. But before we get into our in silico stratification, we wanted to try and narrow down our search. We wanted to see if we could pinpoint the tumor suppressive function of BRCA1 to a specific region. And to accomplish this, a previous Davy Lab, Davy Lab student, Kamran Islam, mapped the location of all BRCA1 missense variants. And while benign variants scattered evenly throughout the length of the protein, there was notable clustering of pathogenics to the N-terminal ring, C-terminal BRCTs, and somewhat serine cluster domains. And considering these missense variants are nuanced with local effects, they are likely pathogenic because they cause a loss of their single contained domain, while other regions may still stay active. Essentially, it seems like BRCA requires all three domains to remain functional in order to complete all of its required tumor suppressive tasks. And this seems especially true for at least the ring and BRCT domains, with both binding specific proteins to serve somewhat independent functions. So from here, two projects were formed from our main uh, hypothesis, both aiming to use loss of a single domain's function in isolation as evidence for pathogenicity for variants within that domain. The focus of my work is on the ring domain, while the BRCT is the focus of Gabby's project that we recently heard about. And when we take a closer look at the ring domain's function, we know that we made a good choice. The ring domain itself is also pleiotropic with many activities seemingly tumor suppressive. But luckily for us, all domain activity seems to be dependent on initially binding to other proteins. So assaying these interactions should serve as a simple but reasonable approximation for overall domain function. But we'll get back to that more in AIM2. Our first key protein, BARD1, is bound through zinc coordination. BARD then binds to additional proteins for various functions, such as epigenetic regulation and maintaining genomic integrity during replication and transcription. The interaction also greatly enhances the contralateral binding and activity of an E2 or ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, the second key protein. At least eight different E2s are known to interact with BRCA1, each with partially redundant activities. For example, marking pro-growth proteins like the estrogen receptor for degradation and forming a scaffold and signal for repair, such as adding a ubiquitin molecule to histone 2A to promote high accuracy DNA repair in a reaction that's dependent on both BARD1 and UVC H5C specifically as the E2 binding. Now that we've narrowed our search to the ring domain, we need to get back to the main aim, stratifying the variants within. Many in silico tools currently exist for this task with examples shown on the slide. They each output a score that roughly estimates the probability that a variant is pathogenic. And these predictions are made using three general patterns from across the proteome where pathogenic variants are usually one, located at a highly conserved residue across sequence alignments from various species. Two, they have a large biochemical difference between the original and mutated amino acid. And three, they have a low allele frequency consistent with negative selection. But usually the best predictors actually employ machine learning to look at multiple of these basic tools and select those that perform best over a diverse set of proteins in order to create an ensemble algorithm. Usually this tool performance is gauged by how accurately each tool is able to separate or discriminate between pathogenic and benign variants that have previously been classified. We know their identity through other evidence. However, the tools that are best at classifying ring domain variants specifically ought to be a little different than those used in these algorithms. For instance, since our domain contains a zinc coordination motif with very little variation across species, we expected to see conservation tools having more value. So for our purposes, we set out to create an algorithm using tools that will optimize performance for the ring domain. To select the tools that are best at predicting pathogenicity on ring, we first identified all known pathogenic and benign missense mutations within the domain that are documented on the comprehensive ClinVar database. We then split off two thirds of the data set for building or training our algorithm with the remainder held out to test how well our algorithm performs on unseen variants. 
Next, training variants were scored on 54 existing in silico tools with representation across all types. And the Renwick's Renwick Labs molecular feature selection software was used to identify these existing tools where there was the greatest difference between how pathogenic and benign variants score. With this, and when this discriminatory performance was plotted, we noted a sharp decrease after 11 tools, which we used as our cutoff for selecting those top performing tools to bring to our next step. So after feature selection, we've identified this list of 11 tools that best predict ring pathogenicity. Notably, most are themselves machine learning algorithms, but we do also see that conservation patterns alone are useful. A TSNI that plotted variant scores across our 11 tools mapped down to two dimensions showed perfect separation between the two groups. But to complete our algorithm, we need to use the MATLAB classification learner to consolidate features into a single score and define a decision boundary where scores flip from pathogenic to benign. The MATLAB application used 32 different mathematical models to try and approach this problem, and not unexpectedly, 23 resulting algorithms identified a perfect boundary that separated pathogenic and benign variants. And each of these 23 also perfectly separated the unseen test set variants, as summarized in our confusion matrix. So to pick the best of these perfect algorithms, we first narrowed our choices down to support vector machines as they provided the most continuous score output, which was best for our goals of variant prioritization. And from there, we chose the linear SVM model as the simple straight line decision boundary was likely to be most general, generalizable to predicting the identity of the US's in the next step. Here, we fed the US scores into the classifier and observed and observed how much or how pathogenic they were expected to be. And the distribution of the US scores was plotted uh, with 64 over here and 264 receiving supporting evidence for and against pathogenicity, respectively. The remaining 130 VUSs in the middle were inconclusive as they fell in a score gap near the decision threshold where we didn't see any known pathogenic or benign variants. And based on a preliminary algorithm we used last year that prioritized a similar set of tools to this one, N16S, C91R, and E100D were selected as our most supported benign, and C27R, H41P, and C24G, which has since been definitively reclassified, were selected as our most supported pathogenic. And in our updated algorithm, these variants still fall within our regions of interest, as shown by the arrows. We need to remember here, though, that these results can only be interpreted at the supporting level, not providing conclusions for variant pathogenicity. And this is mainly due to the massive leap between computationally predicted loss of structure uh, and actual loss of tumor suppression within the human body. Uh, but it's also compounded by a few specific limitations of our algorithm. First, our test set included some variants that were used in the training sets of machine learning algorithms that we used as features, with this overlap compromising our ability to truly test our algorithm on unseen variants. And second, we trained our algorithm with more pathogenic data, which means that when the algorithm sees a variant, a variant it may be more inclined to predict it as pathogenic, biasing the results. Despite these limitations, though, AM1 was successful at accomplishing its goal of stratifying ring VUSs uh, for more definitive functional analyses. Now, recall from before that all ring activity seems to be dependent on binding to an E2 and BARD1. So accordingly, a pull-down assay to quantify both of these interactions should reasonably model total domain function. In other words, loss of binding can infer pathogenicity, because we'll lose all those downstream functions that are possibly tumor suppressive. And in this analysis, we decided to prioritize the most well-characterized E2, UBC-H5C, reasoning that it will be a good model for the similar binding dynamics of all E2s, and that it was specifically good because it's of its involvement in that DNA repair function previously discussed. So to conduct the pull-down assay, we first cloned ring, uh, ring domain DNA containing both a HA tag and our variant of interest into a Petri 2 expression vector. And then vectors were transfected into HEC293 T cells 
where the ring was expressed and bound to endogenous proteins if possible. Next, cells were lysed and ring was pulled down uh, with all the proteins that it, it had bound by magnetic beads containing a tag or containing an antibody against that HA tag. And then upon Western blotting and fluorescent imaging, we expected to see that benign variants have a stronger signal for binding partners compared to pathogenics with low or no binding. And the preliminary results we have mostly agree with these expectations. Our pathogenic C24R and wild type controls define good separation between pathogenic and benign binding character across three, uh, across three biological replicates for both BARD1 on the left and E2 on the right. In these graphs, variant binding is put relative to wild type and log normalized so that anything above the axis means more protein is bound and anything below the axis means that less protein is bound, a result which indicates pathogenicity. And VUS has generally fell in the direction that we predicted computationally with the results summarized in that table. All of our predicted pathogenic variants had significantly lower binding to BARD1 and E2 than wild type, providing consistent and stronger evidence for pathogenicity, just as we hoped. And considering these variants fall at a zinc coordinating, coordinating residue, we can assume that substitution likely results in loss of coordination, reducing BARD1, BARD1 binding, then reducing E2 binding. And since all of this binding activity is lost, all domain function, including that critical tumor suppressive function, will also be lost. Conversely, predicted benigns N16S and E100D displayed similar or higher binding, which indicates that the substitution either does not impact or enhances the interaction interface. But then interestingly, while C91R was predicted benign computationally, it displayed pathogenic character in BARD1 and E2 binding. So let's take a closer look to see which one was probably right. We first looked uh, to see that the location and biochemistry of VUS has supported their probable identity. And expectedly, our pathogenic variants all fell at critical zinc coordinating residues and were non-conservative, while E100D is in an unconstrained region and N16S is pointing away from the BARD interface and is conservative, supporting their benign characters. But then our uncertain variant, C91R, it's also pointing away, but it's non-conservative. So it may impact that critical helix structure and we can't make any conclusions here. So in the future, we can make two improvements to our pull down assay to resolve this C91R variant and similar variants we may encounter down the road. Currently, we are preparing Petri 2 constructs for additional controls to establish binding trends over more known pathogenic and benign variants. And on future replicates, we can start probing for new binding interactions to improve our comprehension for measuring total domain activity. We expect this to reveal limitations in the specificity of our base pull-down assay and confirm the benign character of C91R that was predicted in silico. For instance, if we look at Mori 2s we may catch that loss of UVC H5C binding with C91R is actually rescued by being able to still bind other E2s. And second, probing for other proteins in the complex may reveal that while BARD1 binding is reduced, C91R can still maintain adequate levels of downstream protein binding to retain tumor suppression. Unfortunately though, the combination of functional and in silico evidence is not quite enough for classification with ACMG standards. So what other evidence could we get? First, we will attempt a pedigree analysis. Three ring domain VUSs have been uncovered in patients at Mount Sinai Hospital. And over a long period of time, we'll aim to see if uh, these VUSs segregate with patients' relatives who develop cancer more often than expected by chance or to work around the requirement of multiple ev evidence lines being required for a clinically meaningful classification, we could take a different approach altogether. We know that there's a synthetic lethal relationship between simultaneous loss of BRCA1 and PARP function, whereby PARP inhibition selectively kills cells with dysfunctional BRCA1. So if we take cells with BRCA1 containing a BUS and inhibit PARP with oliparib, in cells that die, 
we have evidence that that variant would render a patient's cancer sensitive to oliparib therapy. That way, we can provide predictive value in a single assay without the precise identification of a critical tumor suppressor function. And then completion of our pull-down assay will have a number of significant impacts. The key one being better defining the pathogenicity of BRCA VUSs. By submitting our supporting in silico, moderate functional, and then for some variants in the future, strong pedigree evidence to the variant curation database LOVD, we should be able to move variant classifications towards likely pathogenic or benign, which would have immediately, immediate benefits for carriers of these variants and their relatives. Second, we will refine our understanding of whether BARD1, E2, or both binding activities are required for the critical tumor suppressive action of the ring domain. And finally, we will validate our domain-specific computational approach as an effective method to stratify variants for more robust analyses, which can be applied in the future to domains both inside and outside BRCA1. And then to close off, I'd like to acknowledge all these people for helping to bring the project to where it is today, specifically the current Davy Lab members, Dr. Davy, Gabby Toretto, and Nicole Archer. Thank you. Question for Matt. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about your uh, Yeah, let's get back to that. Oh, too far. Oh, I didn't even realize there's a, a scroll bar down here. That should make it easier. But yeah, what's the question about the, the TSNE as, uh, as I get it up? So we didn't necessarily expect it, but it wasn't unexpected when we did see it because the ring domain, it's very small, very compact, highly conserved. So we expect that there are big differences between pathogenic and benign variants. Um, also, most known pathogenic variants within the BR uh, within the ring domain fall at those zinc coordinating residues, which are like very obviously pathogenic, and other variants in the ring domain like that fall away from those obvious residues haven't been classified. So we see a consequence of our training set having mostly those obvious zinc coordinating residues in it because it's just harder to classify the other variants. So they're not, we're not able to use them as controls to train our, our algorithm yet. Um, but yeah, the, the big difference, it also means that like for the next plot as well, we don't really know, like, yeah, these variants fall on the benign side of the decision threshold, but there are no benign variants that score there. So we can't really be sure that those have benign character. So I was curious about, oh, go ahead, Chris. So it's clear you got an easy domain compared to Gal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, so, you know, that's actually suggests to me that, yeah, you know, you know a, a computational approach should be more powerful mm -hmm. discrimination because you've got more structure there. Is that in line with the tool, with the performance of the tool that you were using where you identified the data predictor? Like, were the tools themselves very well at separating the... So were they based around structure? Like, pre structure prediction more than conservation, let's say. Uh, but we did actually find that ones that were solely based on conservation were ones that were better than solely based on biochemical, like something like the Blossom matrix. Um, but the machine learning algorithms that perform best had about an equal combination of conservation, biochemical features in there. So they were all important for ring and like there's both very high conservation and like a small change in biochemistry and those mutations would also impact it. So they are both important for classifying, but something like a, like a line GVGD, that tool did really, really well. That's an algorithm that's trained specifically on a BRCA1 alignment. So because the ring domain is so good, like there you would see conservation being the most important. But uh, yeah, conservation alone performed better than biochemical, but 
the best was when you bring both into the fold. Yeah. Uh, and so C91, mm -hmm. what, what's going on there? So I do think that it is benign based on how the computation algorithm predict it, predicted it. It looks a lot like N16S, aside from the fact that it's a little less conservative, maybe impacting that helical structure. Um, right. Yeah, right, right at the end of the helix. So possible impact, but it can probably survive without that still, still bind enough BARD. I do think the reason why we're getting a pathogenic readout on that is because of the limitations of just looking at binding rather than making sure that the protein binds and retains downstream function. Because with C91, we'll probably see that, yeah, the immediate binding is reduced, but it's still able to retain enough downstream activity to be tumor suppressive. So that's uh, the main limitation with making conclusions off of our functional assay right now. I also had a question just about sort of the general general approaches to doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are transgenic mouse models not appropriate for validating mutational, mutational potential? They definitely you would be. It's the age of CRISPR, right? So you can imagine just a factory of, you know, turning out thousands of different mice each to the right kind of variant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, and the... Uh, it would work, and it's actually more favored under those ACMG standards. So within functional assay, there's actually a bunch of like caveats that the functional a that they have to meet. So you need to use enough replicates. You need to actually be looking at the tumor suppressive function, and you need to be using a physiologically relevant model. Where like we've seen yeast assays in the past, now here we're moving to a mammal assay, but a mouse model would have the highest. Kind of say or sway in terms of evidence because it does more closely replicate what actually goes on in the human body. I used to put a while since I looked at the RC1 mutant mice, and I know, you know, the homozygous is usually. Yeah. So it's a little bit inadequate. LOH model or something like that? I still have a lot of work to do, but they have to stick some stick, you know, for a tumor to appear or something like that. From the the nods from Dr. Davy, I let you have to make some some changes to it for sure. But yeah, that's uh that hasn't really been something that we've looked into. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Panchenko has a question. Go ahead, Anna. We can't hear you, Anna. You're 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 unmuted, but uh, you might have to turn your microphone up a little bit or type your question. Can't still can't hear you, Anna. Run over here. <laughs> Ask your uh, we'll move on to another question, Anna. If you want to figure that out or or type your question. So so I, I'm, okay. Go ahead, Cindy. Um. So did you still when you were showing your um your pull down assay here? Yeah. Oh, let's do the this thing again. Right so, there. You said you've got enhanced bonds with some automatic transitions in your PowerPoint. Um, do you think that there could be any concerns with having an enhanced binder, you know, for these functions that might be causing other problems in those cells? Could this be possible? Uh, that's an interesting question. We definitely have to look more into that. But given that the function of the ring domain does seem like solely tumor suppressive, enhanced activity would probably more mean that it's protective against cancer more than a than a burden. Um, but that also goes along with the goal of trying to find or assay more controls in here, because once we get more benign variants, the variants that we know are benign tested, we'll probably see that the character of known benign variants does range a little bit. So it'll like include that range where we see N16 and E100, if that makes sense. Yeah. And would you like to comment, I mean, you've got lot scale data here, you got a lot of data spread between your reference. How are you, you know, are these from a single, how, how are you getting that each data chunk there? Yeah, so each of them were a separate um, like cell line. So we have the same, uh, we have one construct, one Petri 2 construct for each variant. And then each replicate involves transfecting cells with that Petri 2 construct, getting them to express that protein over two days, bind other proteins, 
then lice it and pull it down. And then on the next replicate, we would do another set of transfections. So there would be bio like biological variation between our different cells that are, are transfected would explain for that. Um, and also when we put our binding relative to wild type, it did make some of those differences seem a little larger if there was a more significant difference between how much the wild type bound uh, versus another variant in one assay versus another. Because basically all those data points are reliant on both the fluorescence of that variant, but also the fluorescence of wild type. So the variation of where those points are will be a little bit increased because of that. I think Anna has her mic uh, settled now. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, you can hear me, I guess. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Matt, I have uh, two questions. First question is related to your loss of large protein region slide, if you can please show it. Yeah. I would say this is rather a clarification uh, I'll need from you. Yes. So what do you mean by loss of large protein region, which actually tells us about effects of mesons variants? Are we talking about actually mesons variants or a loss of large protein regions? Yeah. Yeah. What so that, uh, that or uh, Dr. Penchenko was asking about the very strong evidence, what it means for missense variants. And that's the one evidence uh, standard that's not really obtainable for missense variants because most of them do just result in the change of one amino acid. The exception there being missense variants that result in a different splice site, and then you can get truncation of a big region of the protein. But pretty much very strong evidence is only reserved for like large indel mutations where you lose like both the serine cluster and BRCT domains. And because we know that both those domains probably have an important function, like we know that if you lose that sequence, that that variant is going to be pathogenic because it's not able to accomplish those functions that were in the C-terminal domain that was truncated off of the protein. Yeah, I just wasn't clear what this uh, text actually below this box is mean uh, that I thought it actually refers to loss of large protein region, this effect of missense variance. So oh yeah, clear. Uh, this is just for your yeah your for your future for your future reference. And can yeah. you just tell tell me about this um, computational methods? One of the features that you see you mentioned allele frequency, and this is indicative of negative selection. Can you please expand on that? And how would this computational methods use allele frequency as a indicator of a negative selection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So uh, the allele frequency metrics, we use the least amount of these. There was only one like pure allele frequency uh, within our overall, uh, within the 54 tools that we tested out actually. Uh, but a lot of the ensemble algorithms did include them as an additional feature. Basically you're looking at humans, like you're looking at a bunch of sequence alignments from humans for the BRCA gene. Uh, and you're looking to see the natural variation because even though there's like one set sequence of human BRCA1, there's going to be different personal variants that, that people have. A lot of those variants are going to be benign. And those variants that are benign, we may see in multiple people. So a benign variant is able to propagate throughout evolution because it doesn't negatively impact the protein structure. So we'll see some natural allowable variation within BRCA1. But then with pathogenic mutations, we'll expect that they decrease fitness of the human that they're within. So you'll see them propagated less over time. They'll be like selected out during evolution and we won't see them as much anymore. If that, uh, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah it. Thank you for the question. Um, any other questions? Pressing questions? Chris, go ahead. Um, has anybody ever looked at codon uses like rare codons? So rather than it being actual amino acid change, just that you're using a codon that doesn't get translated as well. And that, that suppresses protein. Is that any correlation there with with pathogenicity? Uh, we haven't looked at that, but that's a, a very good question. Yeah, that would be 
more on the like transcriptional effect sides, uh, I guess, like how well it's able to be transcribed translational, yeah, sorry. But now that you bring that up, that could actually explain one of the other kind of anomalies that we've seen in the results. So back when I was explaining the pull down assay, we would expect that you would see about the same amount of DHA tag binding for both pathogenic and benign proteins um, because they should be trans transcribed, translated around the same rate. But we actually see way more pathogenic DHA tag than benign tags. So it may have something to do with how, if they change how well the codons are translated, that, uh, yeah, that could is be that, a possible is that explanation. Your C91R mutation? Uh, that's for all of them. So yeah, consistently across all of our pathogenic and benign mutations with C91R actually falling more on the pathogenic side where we see pathogenic VUSs and the control have more HA tag upon pull down. Yeah. Yep, you can definitely see that. Uh, any other questions? If not, thanks very much, Matthew. Thank I did you. No and uh, before you guys go, there's a test. Sorry. It's in line with uh, my obsession with connections. But if you want to do a little New York Times connections theme puzzle based on this presentation, there's the, the QR code. Purple is very hard but use the words that weren't important to the presentation as a hint. I didn't take a picture. I won't do it now. Yeah, no need to do it now. You can, you know, do it over dinner or something if you want to. All right, folks, you are, you are released. Right. Angel. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. No, I feel like a start. There's a similar one in the possible category. You can just take over. Oh, yeah. Oh, so sad. I become redundant. I do that.